News Talk 106 to 108. Good morning, this is David McWilliams standing in for Pat Kenny. You can text us on 53106 on any issue that uh, you are hearing uh, on this show this morning. Now, 25 women today who are outstanding in their field will be celebrated, sorry, tomorrow in the Four Seasons Hotel in Ballsbridge. Three of these women join me right now. Emily O'Reilly is the European Ombudsman. Katrina Hallahan is the Managing Director of Microsoft Ireland. And Ashley Keegan is the Executive Director and General Manager of Dell UK, but she's based here in Ireland. The question is... Emily, can women have it all? Oh, don't God. start, don't start. Jesus, I was trying my best. Those are the, oh, you're so predictable, David. All right, what can't you have? I, I think, yeah, I think when, when people talk about having it all, they, they tend to mean, you know, a good, fulfilled, rich personal life, probably including children, partner, uh, and a good, fulfilling professional life. I think at certain times in their lives, those can come together well, but it, it's never something that, that you can retain as a little piece of perfection for too long. Um, sometimes it's a, it's a bit like, you know, when you see the swan gliding along and underneath you don't see the, you know, the, the, the flapping feet going like the clappers in a very agitated manner, which probably is, is what the backdrop to our lives is uh, a lot of the time. Um, so, uh, yes, I, I mean, I think women who feel they don't have it all or who would like a career or who are struggling with family responsibilities or whatever can look at women I suppose, like ourselves and and think it's what 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 we have is 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 out of reach because it is in a, in a way marketed not necessarily by us as as having it all i i think um that uh, yes, nowadays there is no reason why women, certainly in countries, even though we're going through this this economic crisis and so on, but compared to the rest of the world, we are still uh, enormously rich and enormously privileged. And I think there's no reason why women cannot strive to combine the two if that is their choice. And uh, it, it, that's interesting if that is their choice, because sometimes Katrina, you get the impression that women. Uh, I've I've noticed it like working over the years uh, when you're talking one on one to a woman, you know, and they know loads of stuff, but they're on top of the brief, they know exactly, but you get into a sort of a community area or a big meeting and the bloke stands up who might know half of what the woman knows but is really confident and says, well, I'll do blah, blah, blah. And the woman who actually knows it doesn't put herself forward. Do you, do you ever feel this or is this an accurate reflection of sometimes what's going through a woman's head in those sort of boardroom situations and big meeting situations? I think that's that's a little stereotypical because you will also have men who are a little bit more introverted and maybe don't have the confidence who want to put themselves forward either. So I think it it's uh, valid for both sexes to to in that environment sometimes feel uncomfortable. Um, however, research would show that um, you know women are a little bit more um, self conscious or will reflect on do I have the capability do I have all of the qualifications all of the the requirements to do the role to the best of my ability whereas you will find um, our male counterparts would probably say sure I have 80% of it I'll give it a lash and, and do, but, do but the best I can why do you think can. that is I mean do you think like if you look at like the Sheryl Sandberg sort of view when you, when you read books like Lean In she talks about and I find this really fascinating as the father let's say of a daughter you know and you're looking you've got a son and daughter and you're looking at them as, 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 as kids and going to secondary school now and Cheryl Sandberg actually was making the case you know that at pivotal junctions little girls tend to think they can't do things and little boys sorry and little boys feel they can well I think even if you go back to a to a very young age when infants are in the pram you will say people who look, look at a baby in a pram look at a boy and say God he's going to be a great hurler or you know he's going to be um, an ambassador you know and they, even, they even how they hold them, them there have been yes. experiments done and how people approach a girl and they lift her very gently and be very careful with it with a boy even a small boy baby they'd be a little bit more robust with them so at a very very yeah. early age they're getting particular they're signals. getting uh, signals that uh, uh, very different signals on what they're capable of and they're being told from very young ages and even with the the toys and things that they play with is very different so I mean I would be very I, pro allowing everybody to uh, all children to to experience all 
types of play and interaction. Yeah. And Ashley, what do you think of that? I think that, uh, you know, you your experiences are based on the lens through which you look from a very early age. And I would say that, you know, from my own experience, we came from primarily a house of women. So there was three girls, there are three girls and one one son. And uh, my mother and father were always very uh, driven towards pushing females forward and you know being independent and standing on your own defeat and being the best that you could so so my experience is different and I will say actually that you know these type of executive networks that we have that we're involved in today I was somewhat cynical up to about 10 years ago because you know you choose the right the best person for the job regardless of what your gender is what your bias is what type of you know diversity um, section or community you represent <clears throat> until about 10 years ago when I was asked to actually co-found our Dell Women's Executive Network uh, or Women in Search of Excellence which is you know what we've termed and it was the first time in the Dublin site that we had you know cultivated and created this and I found speaking with women at all levels of leadership in there because myself and a colleague co-founded it that actually a lot of women in in the corporate world in the IT world that we were working in across all of the companies in Ireland are experiencing and have experienced that what I call and I shared with with Catherine yesterday that imposter syndrome which is oh I've you know myself and Emily were talking just before we came on air where we will say to ourselves well we've got 95% of the competencies required for the next row but that's not quite good enough where exactly as you said David the man will say well I'm more or less there I've got more than half and and I'll put myself forward regardless so I think you know networks like these role models um, not so sure there were you know whether I'd I'd, I'd I'd you know call myself the most powerful not, not really you know uh, have, haven't gotten affinity with see, the term if you, the, here you go, if you were a bloke and I'd introduce you as one of the yeah. three most powerful you would never yeah. doubt yeah. the fact that you are it's not a question we'd still be preening yeah. 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 <laughs> and it's not really a question of, of uh, it's the term power you know for certainly from, from my own perspective the company I work with my role is to you know work with great teams and to enable those people and that organization to deliver business form performance results by creating value for our customers and it is not something that I'm solely responsible for my entire team. But you, you mentioned this word the imposter, Emily, who is the imposter then? Is the imposter the professionally very, very successful woman? Is that the imposter? Is that what you're saying, the imposter syndrome? It's, you know, I don't know if you've heard of the expression of this inner torque. Uh, so it's like a, 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 a I E T O R Q U E, that voice within your own head that is, is quite prevalent with the people that I speak to in these leadership positions. Women primarily where it's, it's a confidence thing as you're, you know, growing up in an environment and working in an environment that is, you know, the majority are are males. Mm. Um, so you kind of have to, you, your voice needs to be heard. So, you know, I, I, I think it's, it's, um, it's unique. Well, certainly over the last 20 years, I found it's unique to the female persuasion. It's very common, but we don't talk about it enough. And so I think, you know, environments like these is, you know, an opportunity or serves an opportunity to share these type of um, challenges that as women who are starting out in the career n- know and see, well, actually, yeah, somebody else has experienced what I feel, but I'm, I'm not prepared to talk about it. And you think that structured fora are, are easy because people ventilate ideas, things that they were kind of saying, oh, if I, if I, you know, because, you know, you hear this thing, I've always found it, a tr- you know, odd and, 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 and if I were a woman, very annoying, but because, and because I'm a man, it's annoying, this idea that, let's say, Emily, you say oh, a woman is actually making these points and you hear the shorthand in male's brains going, or some male's brains going, there they go again, moaning away. To what extent? There's women you, for you. Yes, that was, a, <laughs> that was, that was, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so to what extent what sorry I didn't uh, to what didn't extent finish. is the is there self censorship going on in the head of women which means that having forum like these are actually very very positive well I suppose in a way they're they're safe for uh, as well you know we're, we're all sort of in the same situation together we can identify as women and and uh, uh, and, uh, and all of that but I think you know what my colleagues were saying here in, in relation to power in relation to that inner voice in your head sort of questioning you I mean if you're you know a lot of us are the firsts to be something and therefore when we look 
at our environment, we don't see many of us there by definition. Mm-hmm. So obviously you're going to question, um, you know, should I be here? But I remember when I, when I went for the position of European Ombudsman, when I went for election, which was a scary um, process, so you had to put out yourself there and, and you had to, you had to sell yourself. And, um, you know, that was quite a scary proposition. But I remember thinking and saying to people that it was probably the first job I'd ever gone for in my, in my career that I felt absolutely confident I could do. I, I had no, I had, and do well. You know, I was, I was very confident because I had built up that, uh, you know, 10 years as national ombudsman and all of that. And I, and I knew my stuff. And that stood to me when I went before, um, parliamentary committees. I was, I was confident. I was, I was sure of my, of, of, of my ground and so on. But this had come from a point years ago. I remember my husband used to say to me that I was the only person I, he knew who could go in for a job interview and come out with five grand a year less than what they had offered me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was like. I know. Lots no. of people like that. There's a lot of people like that. But, but the power thing as well is interesting because I remember many years ago I, I got a, a, a fellowship to Harvard, a journalism fellowship to, to Harvard, which was, you know, a wonderful a, a personal achievement and professional achievement for me. But I remember there were about 24 uh, people on, on, the, uh, on, on the fellowship. They were equally divided pretty much between men and women. And one day the curator of the programme asked us all what we wanted to do, what our ambitions were. And to a man they all said, we want to be editors. And to a woman, we all said, we want to write good stories, <laughs> make good documentaries, you know, do, but you know, break some good stories. the hierarchy wasn't top of your head? And absolutely the, the not. But what was hierarchy. interesting was that the work was the thing for us. The product yeah, yeah, was yeah, the yeah, thing yeah. for us. Not the position. And no, no. And the blokes, like, if even if they were editing their parish newsletter, that was, you know, because it, that was the power thing. Mm-hmm. To us, we reflect on the power after the act. Now, you can't generalise, not everyone. Do you really think artists, so? Because, you know? I mean, on the other hand, you know, many of us men have worked in situations where there is a woman boss and sometimes it could be argued that the deployment of power in terms of, in my own experience a couple of years ago, I have a woman boss, and maybe this was, wasn't in fact to do with her gender at all, but the fact she was a woman, we could talk about, the deployment of power was executed, in my, my opinion, in a, in a rather ungenerous way. That, that was that woman. Yeah. yeah, hopefully, and, I, and, and I, I would agree. I think I've had a number of uh, male and female uh, bosses over my yeah. career, and there's good and bad in all of them. I, I think the the thing for individuals is what you take away from that, what you learn from it, because every interaction or experience is about learning. So uh, you learn how to be better, um, and and you also learn about how to be authentic you know mm-hmm. my my well, big it. thing in in uh, coaching people on but leadership isn't this really is really difficult about, for all of us how yeah. to be authentic because people it's very hard to find you know the real person rather than the acting person yeah. or the projected person but it's hugely liberating if you get the the freedom to actually be true to yourself and and again as i coach young people uh, male and female coming up through the organization i give them that feedback is the more you try to be something you're not the more unhappy you're going to be and the more you're going to be challenged by that. It really yeah, is about being like, true yeah. to your thyself, values, yeah. true to who you are and knowing yourself and being authentic. But, uh, because yeah, that and comes I, think, I think to allow ourselves to be authentic as women as well yes. and not to be imposters or be imitators of, of, of the male leaders or whatever. But I think that comes from experience and it comes from confidence, confidence. that yeah. you are relaxed enough in your own skin. Yeah, yeah no, the other, the other thing I just add is it's not just about women women in leadership and women having senior positions, men play a huge part in promoting and fostering a culture and environment in which regardless of whether you're male, female or a minority group where diversity thrives. Yes. And, you know, I, I'm, and I'm not saying it because I've been with the company 15 years, but I happen to work for a company where it's not just tops down. You know, there's a whole leadership team. There's there's um, networking events, there's employee resource groups, WISE being the, the female employee resource groups, where, you know, they're fostering that culture from the, the bottoms up and, and trying to kind of uh, build it within the DNA of every employee who walks through the door, down to when, you know, our, our graduates leave university. Yeah. And why is a company like Dell doing this? Is it because you feel yourselves to be in hyper competition with other companies for all. those people and therefore you have to treat the people right or is it because you feel that if Dell workers can come in and feel some ownership 
of their own lives, back to your authentic idea that you're actually, you, your, your person, that they will be better workers, they'll be more productive and they'll be happier? There's, there's, there's two reasons, really. One, it's, you know, there's there's been lots of, you know, reports, McKinsey's and otherwise, that has proven that when you have <clears throat> diverse represent, pre- representation at all levels of the organisation and on the board, you experience greater return on equity and return on investment. So you get better economic value by because having... Because the decisions are making be, Because better. there's that diversity of thinking it's yeah. not siloed it's not you know one size it fits all it's good debate and so better decisions are made and as a result better outcomes are driven so that, that's that's the, the first point the second point I would say is you know uh, Emily just touched off it there we represent the market that we serve and the market that we serve is made up of men women you know all different religions races and cultures so you know when you're serving customers regardless of the industry you're in or the, the market you're in or the vertical that you're in you you know, the customer and your client wants to see that the the business partner is representing themselves. So you've got to, you know, it, it's critical to business success to have that diversity, not only of thinking, yeah. but of service. And I think, um, and Microsoft has exactly the same philosophy yeah. around you need to represent your customers. You need to have a, a diverse and inclusive environment where people really can do their best work. Um but I also think you have to have courage as a leader to create that. Absolutely. Um, and I've had experience in the past where, you know, I was in a leadership position where, and in our organisation, 25% of our employees come from 50 different countries across the globe mm-hmm. here in Ireland. So we're very diverse culturally. Um, but at the leadership table, it was all white males. Yeah. Irish white males so there, there was, think, a, okay, a, a, there was a decision on uh, for my decision to say this isn't representative of our employees mm-hmm. this doesn't allow our employees to look at the leadership and say I can aspire to, to be, be there that person. I, I can aspire to be there but so it's create, having the courage as a leader to say this isn't right and we need to change it and create the right environment for our employees to, to have be successful can I, can I, can I move back to this idea of, of young girls and, 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 and Emily you were talking about even the way young babies are mm-hmm. held is, is different and there's, there's always different signals going in all through your through your lives but there's a huge amount of, of work at the moment saying that women actually make better decisions than men in crises, in panics there's a lot of talk about for example in the banks, not just here in Ireland but all over the thing where there was a huge macho-ness yeah. of, of the unique leader you know, the, male, the kind of Napoleonic complex of the leader and the, people argue maybe had there been more women in putting not at the crisis yeah, but all the way up to it yeah, that I, it I, might I have think changed. that point was, was made by Christine Lagarde uh, who's now head of the IMF and who was then in the French ministry, wasn't she? She was a finance minister? She was, the, in, in she was Sarkozy's finance minister. Yeah and I think she when she before she headed up IMF was talking about the banking crisis and talked about the, the, the testosterone was, was, was the problem and, and certainly and So I what does oestrogen do that testosterone doesn't? <laughs> I feel lacking here so you have to explain it all to me. I don't think you do at all actually David <laughs> it might be your problem <laughs> Too much oestrogen? <laughs> Not enough um, uh, well, oh God, I don't I don't know. I mean, I think that um, it was very interesting the the famous or infamous tapes that came out in relation to the Anglo the Anglo yeah, tapes. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, my God, that was those conversations were just fueled by by testosterone, also by panic and and fear, um, and and that that macho culture which was almost primitive in a sense in terms of, of driving forward to to a single goal which was you know, just amassing loads of money and everything else and then it was very interesting the pressure then that that put on perhaps the less macho banks to do likewise and and everybody and the had less to, macho guys and the less macho yes and, and now in a way everybody's been you know nanny has been brought in in the form of regulators and god knows well regulators ombuds and, people and god yeah, knows what yeah, yeah. Oh my god. yeah and 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 everybody's been been told to come but i have no doubt that should things start you know arising again um that, uh, as they say, you know, culture eats strategy for breakfast. And while we have, while we have one strategy going at the moment, economically and, and financially, I, I don't think the culture has been completely leached out of the system. And I think, I, I, again, research would say, uh, if you look back to the caveman days, you know, where the caveman went out and where the hunter gathers, the the females tended to be the community builders. Mm-hmm, and I think yes. Aileen touched on it earlier about it's about team and creating a team environment. And again, not to be stereotypical 
but research would say that that women are engaging in a diverse and and, and very inclusive in decision making so they will ask for input doesn't mean that they won't be capable of making the decision but yeah. they are, are much more about information gathering engaging yeah. with and others not as looking into hierarchies, for experts I think yeah. you know I think men God I hate generalising some men like sure, here we're having a discussion yeah. about men and women yeah. God, 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 yeah. <laughs> like their hierarchies you know whereas I think women uh, and and I know certainly when I went into well both my um, as a national ombudsman and then then this European ombudsman I think there were some people who were surprised when I would pick up the phone to speak to uh, you know a junior official about about something but to me I thought well the junior official has the piece of information that I need to have whereas p- some people uh, preferred well you start at the top and then the top people will go down down the ranks whereas I think that's stupid and inefficient uh, you know so I don't know whether that's a particular female thing or, or it's, what, it's, it's interesting because you know as you go through your professional career and even as a as a young girl growing up you're taught you know independence be independent and stand on your own two feet and you know you don't you don't need anything or anyone and actually you know what you find as you as you um navigate through your professional journey is actually it's all about interdependence which is what yes. i think katrina was touching off of interdependence not only with everybody that works around you with four but also you know your your partner and I think um, I really liked Emily's uh, line in the Irish Times last week where you said, you know, it's really what you do in your professional career. One of the decision, I'm paraphrasing Emily, so forgive me, but one of the decisions is that the type of partner you choose in life because... Well, my husband know, has to forgive me for that comment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because because I, yeah. Not at all. She's shaking her head here, just so yeah. you know, listeners. But, but I do think that, uh, you know, I mean... I I totally concur with being that authentic leader. Know thyself, first of all, and bring some of that to the table in a fresh career. But my husband often says to me, if they really knew what you were like, Ashley, you know. know, Whose partner partner doesn't say if they really know you what you were like, I could tell them. But let's talk about children, okay, Mm -hmm. because... You know, you see on all these all these metrics of, of of girls in school, girls going through university. You see gradually, but absolutely unequivocally, women taking over from men in many many professions, places that women weren't there not ten years ago. I'm not talking twenty, thirty years, but even ten years ago. But then, the family, the fact that you three will probably be asked much more than your male counterpart. How do you combine family? And it's all, and, and it's a value judgment that blokes aren't, well, we don't necessarily get asked. So when you're asked about family, and when you're asked about the difficulty of being a good executive, a good mother, and a good citizen almost, do you get annoyed that men in your equivalent positions aren't usually asked these questions? Not at all. I don't get annoyed um, that men aren't asked the question. You know, I, I think there's there's a perception that you know you're the perfect executive the perfect wife the perfect partner and mother and you know i can tell you i'm not um and i i don't think you know your professional life and your personal life and your family life are mutually exclusive i think they you know fall into my professional life enters into my family life and vice versa hence why i think authentic leadership we, you'll only really survive and be successful if you bring yourself to the table. Um, but I think it's, it's a, it is a, the word balance, you know, has a connotation of 50, 50 and equilibrium. For me, there isn't a balance, you know, it's, it's, um, it enters into different spheres. Um, and I think that it's just having the right ecosystem around you and, and good relationships yeah, and partnerships. And I think I, I would agree. I think um, I actually feel sorry that we don't ask men that question more often mm. because I actually think it's an, an unfair bias in some respects because they are feeling challenged. And I have lots of men who work with me who are struggling with how do I make sure I give enough to my family in time and in uh, engagement with their kids. So it isn't a male, female. It, it tends to come out like that like that but I think we need to be more generous to both uh, parties and make sure that in our, our work environment we try to create flexible working um, as I know lots of other companies mm-hmm. do and allow people to um, understand what their boundaries are what they need out of their life 
all up, not work life, their life, and then make the right choices and support them in making those choices. And it, it, it isn't just a a female question because you know our our partners work, my husband works, we both have full time jobs, and it has to you know it affects regardless of the role that you do two working spouses does affect family life and you have to manage it accordingly just a few texts uh, again to remind you we're discussing about the issue of powerful women but the general topic is the responsibilities uh, that women have when they reach a certain level in society or in corporations and whether or not these are different uh, from their male counterparts. Lots and lots of texts coming in, just a, a few texts. Women convey generalizations and anecdotal truisms about men and no rebuke occurs. When a man uses the same generalization about women, the comments are labeled sexist, says one of our texters. Also, having it all, quote unquote, is a myth. Mm-hmm. Most successful men have also had to make sacrifices, usually by having less family time than they might like. It's all about the choices you make. Sometimes men and women make different choices, says Fran. Uh, with regard to raising little girls. I'm the father of eight, two girls. I found that roughing it and allowing them to climb trees and hurt their knees and jump in the ocean in February has done their confidence a world of good. <laughs> of course, they get a hug when they fall, but I tend to dismiss this uh, when, when, they're, when they are when they're not, when they're, sorry, getting a hug when they fall uh, tends to help. That's from Niall. And finally, messages, the messages given to little boys and girls take second place to biological imperatives that they are born with, says Fergal. Let me just switch now to a world, if you could imagine a world, Emily, you said that you're still in the case, even though the European Commission is a much more egalitarian place than most and has been quite at the vanguard of this, but you still walk in uh, and there's a lot of men in suits. Can you imagine a world where it is almost 50-50 at the top table? And what would that look like? Would it feel different? Would it, would it act different? Would it behave different? Um, I think I can imagine it. I mean, I think that there almost seems to be... It, it's extraordinary the degree to which, as, as you have already re- referenced, uh, women are coming to the fore in different professions and, and business, like my two uh, colleagues here, and they're holding seriously um, uh, strong, big leadership positions in, in, in industry, in, in law, medicine, so on and so forth. Uh, and I think that has to trickle up uh, to the top table. I can't say definitively for fear of being accused of, of, of generalising or whatever... What difference that would make, but I think it would have to make a difference simply by the fact that I think we all acknowledge uh, that women and men bring something different, often complementary to the table, and I think that would have to change the dynamic of the way we we run the world. Very briefly on this, Katrina and and Ashley, very briefly. On yeah, this I, I I think um, I would hope it would happen. I think it's happening already. We're seeing an, an increase in uh, females at the board level and at senior levels, um, and I do think it is about a balance. Um, not one gender or the other. It's about a, a balance and a, an inclusion and a level of diversity, not just on gender, but also on cultural diversity and yeah. skills and attitudes and opinions. I concur completely. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it is about the the what I would call the minority groups represented at the table. And also it's one, one thing to have representation at the table. It's a whole different matter to foster that inclusivity and that inclusive culture. 